Hi and welcome back to the Nook. This is the second episode of Dear Future, Letters to the Future. Um, thanks for watching the first episode if you did. Today is going to be hopefully an exciting one. Uh, I can sort of already feel the despair coming through. Um, it's going to be about the climate and it's going to be about how I feel about the future, specifically about the climate lots of things to think about. Um, I've already sort of said this in my first episode. I've I've been wanting to do a climate-related, future-oriented video, content, podcast, whatever, and this is the episode for that. Um, if you've been a constant viewer of my channel, you will probably already know that the climate is a huge topic uh, in the books that I, I try to cover. It is also a huge thing that I'm trying to reckon with in my own personal life. Um, I am not really thinking a lot about like the usual individual issue like sustainability, sustainable sustainable living or being a bit more eco-friendly or eco-conscious in your everyday life but also really on a more existential level I guess or even just in a more intellectual and emotional level um, what does it mean for us to be in this climate changed world? Um, by now, most people have come to the common consensus that climate change is real. I'm pretty glad we moved past that point. And um, if you've not seen my video on my own personal journey with the climate, with climate consciousness, you can check that out below. But just really briefly, I was never really interested in climate change or the environment until like super recently, actually, only in 2019 or 2020 that I really start to educate myself about all these issues and it's only really in the past year that it has sort of reached this all-time high with me talking non-stop about environmental books and talking about nature and talking about all these concepts like degrowth and consumerism. Uh, it was never really a thing until late until late and and I want to emphasize that that I am not an expert I am someone who has really also started to reckon with all these things much more seriously later on in my life um I'm 24 um and that's already kind of late uh to really open my eyes to the movement and open my eyes to the whole concept but it's never too late I want to say that it's never too late whoever you are wherever you are um no matter what part of the world you're at now, what is this episode going to be talking about? I am going to be going through so many different things, but of course, this episode is going to have a much more future-oriented approach. Um, and I'm going to start this episode off, of course, with a letter to the future. And I guess let's just go. Um, if you want to pen a letter alongside me uh, with regards to the climate, please feel free to do so. I know a lot of you have done that. In, uh, in response to my first episode, a lot of you were really optimistic and hopeful. That was really great. I like. I was kind of surprised to see that so many of you were so hopeful. I think there was this sense of uh, yeah positive energy in the first episode. Unfortunately, I don't think today's episode is going to be as optimistic, but we'll see. So here goes. Um, dear future climate. <laughs> I don't know whether I should be addressing this to the climate, to the people, to the earth or whatsoever, um, but I'm gonna address this very broadly to the concept of the future. Dear future, um, I hope the world isn't literally on fire right now. <laughs> um, I am pretty scared of you. I am pretty scared of where I'll be uh, when you come along. Pretty scared of where my family will be at. Um, I suspect that a lot of things are going to be changing. I suspect that nationwide there will be lots of social unrest. I suspect that the temperatures in Singapore are going to get a lot higher. It's already at around 34, 35 on a regular basis. I will only suspect that you are going to bring it up to an all-time high in the near future. Um, and you know what? I really don't know what direction we're going to take. I'm not sure whether we're going to go all sci-fi and, you know, <laughs> extreme technology 
and I will see all these massive innovations I've never seen before? Or am I going to see something that's a little bit more subtle? In your future, I think there is some glimmer of hope. I'm desperately trying to find some glimmer of hope in all the books I've been reading lately. Uh, But you are extremely elusive, especially when it comes to climate change. I feel like there's so much information speculating you with regards to climate change, but no one really knows. I mean, that's what people have tried to do in the 70s and 80s, and uh, look where we are now. So I'm not trying to be too hopeful about the speculations. Um, Let me just say that I hope we're on good terms. I I really don't know. I feel like we are not really on good terms right now uh, with regards to climate change. Uh, And I'm sorry. I think that's really humanity's fault. Not really your fault for time passing by. Uh, Yeah. Sorry, this letter was a bit uh, dull. That's really because I I have no idea what to say to you. Um, And I don't really have a vision to articulate to you that I think would be probable in the future. Um, At the very least, I I do hope that I'm alive. (laughs) And I do hope my family is alright. But I also do hope that maybe, just maybe, uh, I get to see a little bit of that paradise that I've been reading about. A paradise where people are living off the land. uh, A paradise where different cultures and different sort of traditions are being respected, that the earth is also respected in return. Um, I kind of hope we don't go down the direction of too much technology or like too much artificial technology kind of feel like that kind of approach. Like I kind of want to move away from this technology will save us all kind of mentality. Uh, But it's not in my power to dictate that. So we'll see what direction you'll bring us into um, future. Thanks for listening to me. Uh, It's been great knowing you for this second episode. (laughs) So that was my letter to the future. Um, Yeah, as you can tell, I feel extremely ambivalent about climate change. I don't know how much of you, how many of you feel this way. But it kind of feels like the world is going to end pretty soon. I don't want to be like apocalyptic. Uh, I don't want to introduce any sort of... <laughs> con- what's it called? Controversy? I don't want to... Oh, conspiracy theories. I don't have con- conspiracy theories. Although I have been binging quite a lot of them on a very unhealthy basis the past few weeks. Um, it's not a good place to be at. Uh, but yeah, it definitely does feel like doomsday is coming. Uh, Just this month alone, we've recorded record high levels of floods, temperatures. There's also crazy hailstorms happening. Um, And it's not really great, I think, to see all these images and to have this very physical manifestation of the warnings that people have been, you know, putting out there, announcing for the longest time. And, you know, when all these announcements were made, I was such a little kid I never really thought about it but now I can sort of clearly see the progression from global warming as this sort of scientific inquiry into now a climate crisis that impacts not just the physical livelihoods of people but also the society the social fabric the economy everything politics now we see that the climate crisis is not just a scientific warning, it is definitely an entire existential threat in some ways. Um, And we're only really starting to think about it that way. Uh, And that has been sort of present in the news. I am really heartened to see that there's a lot more local news media that's covering climate change. Um, But definitely not so political um, because, of course, wanting to organize and be a lot more politically vocal in Singapore is something that It's not really a thing. I don't know how else to describe that. Um, But if you're from here, you would probably know. um, A lot of activism is a lot more subtle. It is a lot more navigating legislation. Uh, Not so much putting up placards and telling the government to change things. doesn't really work here. So 
activisms here in Singapore is not very obvious, but there is an increased sort of awareness of climate change. And yeah, so now what? <laughs> what do we do with this awareness? What do we do with it? Because uh, I have said this a few times on my channel, I struggle a lot with articulating the future, and that's why I started this podcast, because I wanted to get better at it. I wanted to be a lot more confident in saying that this is what I want to see in the future, and I want to be able to say that not just for myself but for people around me and my friends and I guess the entire landscape of things um, things are just very despairing and rightfully so I think people have the right to feel very despairing a lot of climate despair and grief um, when it comes to seeing all this news and all these really doomsday like reporting so I just want to say that there has been a couple of resources that I've been binging a lot the past few days even. Um, there is this channel done by, I think, Jack Harris. Um, he was a very popular YouTuber turned now climate advocate. Um, I think the channel, I'm not too sure what the channel is called, but um, he does do a few videos on climate change and very informative videos. There is one that he did recently that was about how we only have about nine years left to really change things around. Um, in case you didn't know already, um, there has been reports saying that keeping global temperature rise rising to a limit of two degrees is really too much. Like That's a far stretch out. And instead, we should be capping it to 1.5 at the very maximum, and we're already beyond 1.1. So that is you know, a really small margin to be working things around in. That's about a margin of 0 0.4, I guess. Um, there's also this documentary on Netflix that's about, I guess, the great boundaries, or is it the great limits? Um, planetary boundaries, and it's about this concept that there are certain tipping points in the ecosystem and in the equilibrium of the planet that once you cross over, it'll be very, very difficult to backtrack on. So there are a lot of tipping points that scientists have been warning us about, some we have made progress on, some that are really uncertain. Um, yeah, and, and there's just a lot of things to consider. So the science is all out there. I think the great thing is that now th these things are a lot more accessible. So it is not an excuse. Like, to be educated about climate change is not really too difficult. Of course, I would say it really depends if you're in a place where you have internet access and you're relatively safe and you have the time, you have you know all these different resources to get educated, you very well should be educating yourself at this point. If you're watching this video, most likely you have the capacity to educate yourself and to learn about climate change issues right now um, and it's true that the mo the people who will get affected by climate change the most will be people who are in um, so-called you know much more developing economies and people who are you know living much well below the standards of living um, in the global north countries that's that and that's the context of this episode um, and i just want to talk about now the articulations of the future <laughs> when we have all this information so what do we do um, there's a few things i want to talk about first of all i want to talk about the idea of climate change the idea why it is so hard to imagine um, the reality of it, and also why is it so hard to imagine a future where we can actually bring um, human-caused climate change under control. There's this book by Amitav Ghosh, which I have right here. Right here, and it's called The Great Derangement, Climate Change and the Unthinkable by Amitav Ghosh, which I, I already said that. So <laughs> this is a book this was a book that was published in 2016. So that's like a whole five years ago. Um, but the ideas here are super, super, super timely and resonant. And in this book, uh Ghosh talks about how climate fiction or like climate is just not a topic in literary writing that is addressed sufficiently. He talks about 
really about the literary canon, about how climate change is seen as something that's very improbable, seen as freak accidents, seen as something that is far beyond our comprehension, that it is operating beyond the confines of what is a modern novel. Um, And it's a great book. I think it really illuminates a lot about why we don't really have a lot of stories about climate change or why we don't seem to really understand the scale of it um, or we don't really seem to have the imaginative capacity uh, to really come up with all these solutions to climate change. I feel like when I was reading this book, so many things were made clear to me. It is true that climate fiction or cli-fi, if you know, is still considered somewhat sci-fi. Um, and you know, when we think about sci-fi, it is a genre that was literally invented because so much of its writing just didn't fit the norm of what literature was supposed to look like. Because literature, I guess in the modern sense, was supposed to be realistic. It was supposed to depict very human sentiments. It was supposed to depict this very specific kind of human sensibility um, that they didn't really consider the way that we actually experience the world, the way that we actually interact with non-human actors, the way that narratives don't just unfold in a one main character focus. Narratives actually unfold in multiple ways and not necessarily in a linear way, uh, which is how a lot of literature and modern novels are constructed. So I think it's a great book if you are wanting to go deeper into the literary traditions. And that kind of speaks to why, um, creatively, we can't seem to really comprehend climate change, or we can't really seem to convince people of the reality of climate change, because climate change and reality just don't seem to be um, compatible concepts, which is what Gosh argues for. And to some degree, I, I think it's true. I think we tend to still see extreme climate changes as freak weather incidents. We don't really see it as the new reality or the kind of things we have to prepare for, what we think is permanent, like our housing, our political systems, our food systems even, what we think as things that are supposed to be permanent of human civilization are now being so quickly undone by nature that we are like, what the heck? Like... There's no way that this could have just been undone in a day, but it's completely possible. But we just don't have the capacity to really grapple with that truth, um, I think, or at least I don't have that capacity to grapple with that truth, especially coming from a place in Singapore where stability as a narrative is so strongly pushed. So yeah, climate change and the future. Um, I am not really able to comprehend how things will change in the future. Um, And this has sort of compelled me to start binging a lot of different types of content in order to psychologically cope with this inevitable change (laughs) that is climate change. And, you know, that includes things like um, watching a lot of disaster prepping videos. (laughs) And now I can't... I can't stop having them recommended in my feed. Things like the top crops you should be growing, um, what you should have in your disaster pack, where to move, uh, which is impossible because where can I move here? (laughs) Being in Singapore, uh, there is no sort of rural area to move to. um, And also geographical tensions is another thing to consider. Uh, Definitely the whole prepping culture is very much tied to also different cultures of yeah like doomsday believers and apocalyptic i don't know there's just so many things right and not just that i've been binging a lot of yeah cottage core sort of content um homesteading videos which is near impossible here again in singapore so this really begs the question what do we do um as urban dwellers what do we do in the face of climate disaster um in singapore there is not a lot of talk about this uh, i think for good measure because so many things are kind of protected here um there is a lot of effort there is a lot of investment in flood proofing the country 
uh, which is a very smart move because, yeah, I mean, the infrastructure is pretty important. Singapore is a pretty small city, so any sort of climate disaster can really easily uh, de- deal a massive destruction and a massive economic loss because everything here is about economics. Everything here is about potential for profit and also economic losses. So um, definitely the government is doing a lot of work in kind of climate proofing the country uh, but definitely there's not a lot of psychological prepping uh, we don't really think about it I, I don't think a lot of people actually do think about climate disasters and freak accidents uh, if you would consider them freak anymore because the past decade or so has really seen records being broken year after year after year so are they really considered freak accidents or are they just considered the new pattern. There's this book that I read called The Nature of the Future. It's written by Elizabeth Colbert, who is a pretty well-known environmental journalist. She has written a lot of work about the environment and climate change in general. The Nature of the Future is her latest writing, uh, and it's a pretty good book, uh, definitely for people who are interested in the future (laughs) of mitigating climate change. Uh, Definitely some parts were very very specific she talks about carbon capture technology she talk about she talks about dna engineering uh things like artificial breeding um ecosystems ecologies there's just a lot of things in this book and she talks just about i think three main chapters one is about the sky one is about I think biodiversity, another one's about carbon. So it is very, very interesting. Um, At the same time, I think there is a sense of skepticism. I think Colbert kind of has an overall sense of, yeah, of disbelief or not disbelief, but she has an overall sense of, of detachment from the whole realm of technologies that are supposed to save us from climate change um, and when I was reading this I was also reading Brady Sweetgrass and I was also uh, reading other books on climate change that kind of advocated for a much more um, I guess a much more lifestyle approach which means like reducing consumption reducing capitalistic tendencies um, these are all kind of yeah, they were all kind of juxtaposed against one another. And I found a very interesting um, parallel. I felt like really like the only way to really go about doing all these things is just to backtrack a lot. But the fact is, what is progress? We always think of progress as moving forward. Um, but would progress actually be moving backwards instead? And this is a concept that I think Adrian Marie Brown actually talks a lot about in a lot of her works on political organizing, um, the idea that care and the maintenance of care, maintenance of organizations and maintenance of the environment and people and generally the world is an act of progress in itself. Um, this is something that also um, How to Do Nothing by Jenny Odell, this is a key concept in that book as well questioning the idea of progress what does it mean to move forward um what does it mean to actually make advancements in civilization um and to me i think it is really dangerous if we think that advancements in civilization necessitates a further distancing of human from the environment Uh, this is kind of scary this is kind of like example is really like Jeff Bezos kind of flying himself into space (laughs) that is like the prime example of that direction Um, but what if progress was actually going back to the land going back to more of a collective approach to the environment um, and towards respecting the earth Um, I think breeding sweetgrass really touched a lot on this about having a reciprocal relationship towards the land and I sort of suspect I mean, I sort of predict that the next big thing in um, climate advocacy is spirituality. This is definitely something that we don't think a lot about because we have enough hard facts. We have a lot of science. Um, But we always know that humans are not necessarily driven by science all the time. Even when we think about science today, a lot of people can make the case that science also functions as a type of religious belief. Um, This devotion to rationality, this devotion to um, empirical fact, this can also constitute a kind of 
fundamental belief um, that also requires you to take a leap of faith into believing, right? Um, yeah, because if you think about it, um, beliefs are beliefs. Um, science is still human perspective. It is, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I could, I, this is another topic for another video, but I'm not going to go too much into it. Uh, but I do believe that moving forward, uh, we need direction in the way that we are dealing with climate change and that direction can only really be provided by a much more existential, philosoph philosophical and spiritual understanding of ourselves and the land. And this is going to sound so fluffy, I agree. Um, yeah, I, I agree, it sounds really fluffy, um, but I feel like we're at a point where we really need it. Um, I'm also not someone that just advocates for you to pray it away <laughs> i'm also not someone that believes in just doing nothing but you know just endlessly hoping that things will get better i don't think so i do think that uh spirituality is also very much reinforced by a very very sort of healthy and loving relationship with one's environment um and really the book that helped me so much in this is really reading sweetgrass and i am interested in reading a lot more books about this the ecology and also us being humans um it's just a huge topic um, that hopefully will give some more direction to what i'm feeling and i also want to kind of implore more people who are interested in the environment to not just learn more about the hard facts but also kind of develop a more sentimental attachment to the world um not the world but to the earth and to nature and to understanding where we are going so i think one movement that's really tied to this whole concept in this whole video is the idea of solar punk yeah basically solar punk if you don't know what it is about it is um about radical visions of the future that is centered on yeah, renewable energies, about restorative agricultural practices, about having this sort of reciprocal and healthy relationship to land, and also has a lot of very collective and socialist sort of ideologies, uh, which is really interesting, which I think provides a lot of great alternatives to what kind of situation we're in right now, which is a strongly extractive capitalistic economy that sort of prioritizes profits um, and I know that in my channel and my content I talk a lot about capitalism I talk a lot of bad stuff about it um, honestly it's just a system it's it's a system that we enact and we can sort of assess and tell people to let it go um, of course it's not easy it's gonna take a lot of different factors um, but I'm not going to blame everything on just one economic system. It also requires a lot of shifts in mentality in a lot of other areas, uh, which I've talked about as well, right? Not just um, talking about extractive mentality, but also understanding non-human actors, understanding our place in the world. Also, it's just like, yeah, you know, the world has really been around. Um, there's this video that I watched lately and it's called The Time Lapse of the Future. It's by this channel called Melody Sheep, which is a very cute name uh, for such a serious video. Uh, basically, it's a video talk... It's just a time lapse. It's a massive time lapse of how space and time will unravel. Um, it goes way beyond Earth. It goes into like galaxies and other galaxies i don't even understand it it just goes into like trillions and trillions and trillions of years basically um earth is is just one really small thing and if you look at the climate science uh earth has not always been this stable um earth has its phases and we humans have only really flourished in a relatively short stable period of time where temperatures were all right and you know the complex systems that we've created is truly astounding and i i, I think i really believe in <laughs> the capacity of of humankind to really start to be part of the ecosystem again to be part of the earth again uh in a way that i don't know man it's just uh this is way too much for my brain to process right now so <laughs> But if you get what I mean, um, this is pretty much as far as my imagination goes. Uh, everything else is kind of muddy, muddy, 
confusing, confuzzling, I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, but honestly, this is where I am right now. My only vision for the future is me being able to grow some potatoes in my balcony, um, brewing some tea for myself from the leaves that I've grown, uh, being able to sort of actually go out in the sun uh, and not fear that my home is going to be swept away um, also not having to worry too much about food security um, not having to really worry about people who ha- whose homes have been swept away by climate disasters that everyone has the right to stay in wherever they flee to uh, because you're go- we're going to see a lot of that in the future um, people are going to have to move this is human history we have always been moving around in search of better places to live Um, and a concept that i have been thinking a lot about is also what kimura talks about in breeding sweetgrass talking about how do we become indigenous to the land how do we become native to our environment Um, how do we practice bioregionalism, which is something that Odo talks about in her book as well, on how to do nothing. This is such a key concept that I've been seeing so many parallels in all the books that I'm reading. How do we become, how do we become indigenous to the land, really? Um, Kimura gives the example of the white man's footstep, I think. It's a kind of plant that was brought with the settlers uh, when they came to the indigenous lands in Native America, um, it was a native. Pl- uh, it was an, an a foreign species, but eventually was able to take up a certain specific spot in the ecosystem, and every part of the plant has been proven useful to the indigenous people over there, such that they've sort of adopted it into their encyclopedia of things or like the treasure chest of things, the knowledge chest of things, um, and they've sort of embraced it as part of the natural landscape, even while also recognizing that it has once come from a foreign land. When I heard this story, I thought that was really such a heartening, it was a really, really heartening and really encouraging story, because I come from a background of this like migration, I come from a place where I do not even know where I belong to, uh, that my identity is always shifting. It's always very, very hard to pin. Uh, But the fact is that moving forward, what matters is that I find myself part of the ecosystem and I find myself being able to coexist with the people and with the land. um, And that is what I should be focusing on in the future. Uh, Because the fact is that a lot of us come from foreign lands. But what matters the most is that we do not disrespect the land and we also do not disrespect the people who have been on the land or who will come to the land. Um, And that's my only compass going forward, I think. Uh, So yeah, that's it for me. I don't really have anything else to say other than the fact that all these thoughts have been settling in my mind um, and this podcast episode... I don't really have a very clear vision, uh, which is the whole point of talking on this episode, I guess. Um, Actually, if you have certain visions for the future, maybe you're inspired by solar punk or you're inspired by somewhat of some kind of uh, utopian future, uh, do let me know what that future looks like for you in in the comments below. To me, um, I actually want to see a lot of buildings with urban gardens or urban farms. I want to see a lot of community gardens that provide food. I also want to see a lot of support for agricultural sectors. I also want to be able to live alongside wildlife um, and to have a circular economy in a way that our food is being processed that everyone gardens that would be really cool if everyone gardens um yeah (laughs) i mean small dreams right small dreams i don't know big dreams i don't really think about massive technologies i'm really thinking on a small scale but if you have massive dreams you think that certain geoengineering technologies might be the way to go just share 
those thoughts down below and actually I'll be more than willing to learn about all these new things actually. I, th I do think I'm taking a bit more of the um, <laughs> bio-regional and ecological approach to climate change now. Uh, yeah, so thanks for watching. Thanks for staying with me out all the way and I really enjoyed reading all of your comments on the previous episode. It was really nice, really comforting uh, and I hope that this episode would be a very interesting discussion uh, point for you all as well uh, to share not just with your friends I guess but with anyone and to help you feel less alone in this climate despair. I I am safe here in Singapore. I am immensely glad for that and my heart goes out to all of the people whose homes and whose lives have been really severely affected by all the really crazy um, climate disasters the past few weeks. I think it's kind of crazy. I, I really hope that um, things are sort of manageable and I hope that you'll be able to get back to your lives soon. So hang on and I hope we can all get through this together. So yes, thank you. Wow, this was a lot. This was a lot. So thanks again. Uh, I hope the next few episodes will be a less will be less despairing. I don't really know. Um, I will be talking about mental health um, and also other topics, uh, maybe even gender, sexuality. Those are going to be a, a, hopefully a bit more lighthearted. I don't really know. <laughs> Nothing's really certain. Uh, but yes, climate change is probably the most gloomy topic that I will cover on this podcast. So congrats, you survived 30 minutes, I think, of me just basically being unable to cope with the future <laughs> so thanks so much for doing that for me uh, i do hope you're still having a good day if not i do hope that you'll get a good night's rest tonight you deserve it and i'll see you in the next video thanks so much and bye